Hi y'all, this is Eba, and you can find me as The Charm of It on Ravelry, Instagram, or my blog, which is at wordpress.com, and I'm here to unpack my knitting basket again. I just wanted to finally remember to say thank you for tuning in and leaving comments anywhere. I really enjoy chatting with all of you, and I started this podcast because I don't really have any knitting enthusiasts in my local life. And so it's really fun to be able to connect over the internet. My setup is a little different today because I live pretty far north. So the sun is setting around 420 these days. And so usually I try to record earlier in the day and I wasn't able to today. So instead of using my computer's webcam, I'm using my fancy camera in the hopes that the light will be better. I've never tried to do a podcast with my regular camera before, so it looks like I'm going to have to splice clips together, and um, hopefully it'll work. If not, I guess I'll just re-record next week because, or tomorrow or whatever. Anyway, the point is, that's why my setup has changed a little again, so now I'm directly in front of a window, and hopefully we'll get whatever afternoon light is left. I'm going to combine the tips, topics, and questions segment all together and talk about sweaters today. After I do my projects, Moth is around here somewhere. Thistle is with me, you just can't see her. There she is, I know, baby. Anyway, and today I'm wearing my Guernsey sweater and my Shetland hat because I'm right in front of the window and I like to leave my windows open to counteract my building's radiators. And I am drinking a hazelnut cafe au lait because I have to do quite a bit of apartment cleaning and tidying after this, so I need some caffeine. And with all of that out of the way, let's talk about knitting. Mom is trying to figure out how to get here because I'm using her cat tree for all the books I'm going to talk about later. Come here, sweetie. No, not the coffee. Come on. Okay, sorry. Hey, silly. Just jump. You're a cat. So first I'll do finished objects, and I might have to tap my computer to tell it to focus, but we'll hope for the best. Okay, so first up, I finished my mom's Christmas hat, which is in Quince and Company's Chickadee in the Wine Sap colorway, which is a beautiful red. It's a little more muted than it's showing up. I think reds are really tricky to capture digitally. I really love how it turned out. Oh, Moth figured out how to get in my lap. I'm in the smaller chair today, so we all just barely fit. And let's see, can I tap? Come on. Nope, apparently not. I thought that would work. There we go, okay. Woo. So you can see the pretty stitch pattern. Chickadee has beautiful definition, and I'm very excited about how this turned out. I used the Starflower pattern from Textured Stitches, which is a book. I got it from my library as an ebook, but I modified the crown. The pattern is written to have a ribbed crown, and I just thought it looked a little strange, the transition, especially since the pattern is written with a folded picot brim. So I just did plain stockinette on the crown, and I added a spiral decrease for fun. And my mom, wanted a hat very similar to the hat I gave her last year out of Chickadee. She is very sensitive to wool and Chickadee is pretty much the only wool she's tried on that she can wear. Um, so I was happy to do that. It's a folded brim for extra warmth around her ears. She lives in South Texas, hence why I, I was fine with a few yarn overs. And basically I blocked it like a beret because the hat I gave her last year was a mistake. So it ends up as a slightly sludgy beanie. Is it gonna Hey, at least it's smart enough to go back and focus. So that's the finished result. I really like it, and I can't wait for my mom to see it. I have a personal finished object as well as another Christmas one, so I guess we'll do the personal first. I finished my pinch of nutmeg shawl. I have not blocked this yet because I'm pretty new to blocking shawls and stuff and I want to do some research first because I really like how it is already. And are we going to get it to focus? Woohoo! Okay, I think I might have figured out this. So as you can see, it's just a simple stockinette body with a garter stitch border up top and then a really fun garter ruffle on the bottom. And it has a pico bind off, which took forever. 
Um, but it was totally worth it. I ended up putting stitch markers every 50 stitches to give myself kind of landmarks, and that made it a lot more fun. This is um, the Fiber Company's Road to China Light, which is a sport weight yarn, and it is so luxurious. It's a blend of baby alpaca, silk, cashmere, all. Oh, sorry, my coffee just got knocked because Moth was jumping on her cat tree. Let's drink a little more of it. Okay. Sorry, I thought my camera might have stopped for a second. So it is a blend of camel, baby alpaca, silk, and cashmere, and it has just the most beautiful drape. I knit it on size fours, I think, but I went up to size fives for the ruffle, just to make it a little bigger. And this is a free pattern. It was um, Cinnamon Grace on Ravelry, so you can get it. I really like the simplicity. You knit the body this way and then you pick up a whole bunch of stitches for the ruffle. And as I've mentioned before, I'm doing an ongoing experiment where I'm trying to figure out what neckwear options work best for me. And I think that these kinds of shallow crescent shawls are definitely going to work really well because I have several options to wear, but the one that I like best is to wrap it once for warmth, snugly around my neck, and then second time for decoration, and then I've got two cute little fluffy ends. So I definitely will be trying out more of these shapes of shawls in the future. I haven't blocked it, but I did wear it on a rainy day, so it got a little wet. Um, anyway, so if you have any tips for blocking, please let me know. And yeah, I ended up buying a sweaters quantity from Ravelry D Stash of another yarn from the Fiber Company because I loved this one so much. And this is a really pretty brown color. I can't remember the color weight, but the one I got for the sweater is also brown. So hopefully that'll arrive and I'll be able to show it to you soon. So the final finished object is yet another stuffed animal for my niece. This is the last of the big ones, and then I'm gonna do a few more of the baby bunnies because apparently she can't get enough of those. Sorry about my camera's autofocus. I'll try to mess with that more next time, but if I had done any more experimenting this time, there'd have been no sunlight left. You can see I need to work with the white balance a little too. But okay, so this is the squirrel. Hi, Mom. There we go, okay. It is a free pattern by Sarah Elizabeth Kellner, who does a lot of very clever, very realistic animals, and she tends to knit them. They're all in the round, so there's no seaming, and there's a lot of short row shaping. I don't think Moth likes me invading her cat tree. Anyway, so I knit the body out of Knit Picks Hawthorn in their aquatic speckle colorway, which wasn't my niece's request. And the tail, which takes forever, because you have to deply every single strand of yarn. First, you have to tie them all to the pipe cleaner, and then you have to untwist them and then brush them while well, I brushed them. And untwisting the sock yarn was a bit challenging, so I mixed this with some of the Barocco Ultra Alpaca in the Azul colorway, which I thought would go really well. So yeah. This was fun to knit up. I was a little confused by one of the directions, but I contacted the designer and she got back to me right away. Um, and this is the first time I've had any problems with her directions. I embroidered the squirrel eyes with a little of the leftover brown yarn that I used for my shawl scarf. Um, but I'm wondering if I should redo it with black eyes so that it would look a little better. So still undecided on that, but yeah. And she's a little smaller than the other two stuffed animals, but she's still quite cute. She doesn't stand up on her own terribly well. I was going to weight her with a few coins, but then if my niece wants to snuggle with her, you don't really want coins smacking you around. So, pretty pleased with that. I'm making good progress on my Christmas list. Okay, so it looks like I have another eight minutes. Um, so I must just have to record in fragments. And hopefully the focus, I'll practice this week so that I'm not tormenting you guys so much. Anyway, okay, work's in progress. I am still working on my marzipan socks. Um, I am 
have just finished the gusset decreases on the second sock. This is the Pointel sock pattern by Cookie A. It's my first experience with a Cookie A pattern and I absolutely love it. I plan on knitting a lot more of her stuff in the future. I am knitting it out of Quince & Company's Finch yarn, which is not super washed, but it is a really tightly spun fingering. And it's in their Adouin colorway, which is the lighter of their natural heathers. So. I know I've mentioned this before, but I really like doing kind of frilly socks in more neutral colors. And I'm having a really good time with it. Can't wait to finish it so I can start wearing the socks. I know, and they match moth. <laughs> So, with the leftovers, I'll see if I can combine them with the brown that also matched moth quite well. So, there we go on that. Hi, sweetie. And then, I have got quite a bit of progress made on my dad's Christmas hat. This is with the Riveroni pattern. Come on, focus. And it's got the Jingle Bell stitch marker on it. There we go. Okay, so it's the Riveroni pattern, which is a free download on Ravelry. And I'm using Quince and Company's Owl. It's actually Owl Tweet, which I think is more tweety and a little bit more heathered than the oak colorway. It's a really pretty multiple shades of brown. It's a little warmer. My camera is skewing cool in the white balance right now. We'll see if I can fix that in editing. But... I love this yarn and it blocks into a really nice smooth fabric. So this will match my dad's mittens that I made him a couple months ago. And I did have to rip back. So first I was following the directions for the large and it was just this yarn is super stretchy I think because it's wool and spun and it's 50% alpaca. So I did a few inches and then I tried it on and it was just gigantic. So instead I am knitting this I went down a needle size and then I started following the directions for the small instead of the large. And I think it'll work really well because my head is like 22 and a half inches around. And even a men's large head isn't going to be much more than 24. And as you can see, it stretches really nicely. Ooh, see, still plenty of space. Well, you would be able to see if my camera decided to focus. There we go. Okay. Maybe. Hi, camera. Still plenty of space. I'm really sorry about the technical issues. And of course, I'm still following the directions for the length of the large. And I decided that since the fabric is going to be stretched, but I want it to be really warm. Here, we'll just do that since the camera's decided it should keep its focus there. Um, since I knew I wanted it to be really nice and warm, and you know, when fabric stretches, then it becomes less windproof, I'm going to do a fold of brim on this one as well. So I'm knitting for two inches longer than the pattern calls for before doing crown decreases, and then I'll sew it up as a fold of brim later. So I think I've got about an inch, an inch and a half to go. It's just four by one rib, so really simple. And it's been going pretty well. My other hat, I have finally finished the brim. Come on, camera. Why are we focusing on the bed now? There I am. Okay. So, as I think I've mentioned on two podcasts now, I am designing a hat out of Quince & Company's Piper, which is their lace weight, 50% merino, 50% mohair, all from Texan Animals. Um, this is the Abilene colorway, which is a really pretty gray with a lot of pink and purple kind of mauve-ish undertones, which is my favorite kinds of grays. So I am designing it inspired by Gothic architecture to join in the art history craft along hosted by the Knitting Pretty podcast. And so for the brim, I did a really intricate oak leaf stitch on my triple zero needles to make sure that there would be stitch definition and to make sure it would be nice and thick around the brim. And so I finally finished that. I got it long enough for my head. It took a while. It was a little fiddly. And so I blocked it to make sure it wasn't going to grow too much and 
grafted it together and it fits great. So I picked up the stitches and now I've started the body, which I am doing two different things. So it's in four sections and each section is the same. But okay, so I'm doing an arch lace pattern because Gothic architecture were all about their arches. So there's going to be three arches in each section and then dividing each of the sections, I'm using one of the patterns from my Twisted Stitch Knitting Dictionary, which also struck me as quite gothic. Um, and so I'm one of those people who, when I get inspired by something, I really like to run with it. So the reason why there's four of the Twisted Stitches is for the four books of the gospel. And then there's going to be 12 arches total, three in each section for the 12 disciples, because gothic cathedrals were obviously very into Christian iconography and so I'm going to knit the body and then I'm going to put a lifeline in and play with crowd decreases because I really want to evoke kind of the flying buttresses and all of the beautiful stonework that the cathedrals have. So it's going so much faster now so I knit the brim on triple zeros but now the, the lace I'm knitting on a size one and it just seems you know like speedy knitting by comparison. And I really loved the yarn hitting the brim, but now that I'm knitting it more as how it was designed to be, I'm just absolutely in love. I can't wait. I have enough to knit a big wrap stool, and I can't wait to start that. Okay, one more work in progress, and then we will start talking about sweaters. And it actually is a sweater, so let me take a drink first. Uh, last weekend, I noticed that I was at 99 projects after I cast on my mom's hat. That was my 99th. And so I was kind of torn about what to do for my 100th because, of course, I have all this Christmas knitting. But, um, you know, 100, it seems like a nice milestone. So I thought maybe I should do something, you know, to recognize it. So for a few days, I was completely torn and I ended up balling up all kinds of yarn while I was waiting because I hand wind everything. So I hand wound all the other yarn I'll be using for Christmas gifts. And finally I decided to go ahead and cast on the next sweater which I had planned as my 100th project because I figured um, I was far enough in my Christmas list that I could start working on it. My hesitation was that I tend to get really focused on sweaters. I want to see how they're going to turn out. So they tend to monopolize my knitting time once I cast them on. And so I hadn't cast it on yet because I wanted to be sure that my Christmas stuff got done. So, um, this is out of Blue Moon Fiber Arts BFL Sport, which is 100% Blue Face Luster, and it's in the PDX Rose City colorway, which is a really pale kind of rose water tonal pink and, that I absolutely love. So here's my gauge swatch, and I did one side in I think it's double moss stitch when you only change every two rows because this is the background for the cable on the body and it's also what I'm going to knit the sleeves in. So I wanted to make sure I had a good idea for that. And then the other side, just plain suck net. And I knit it in the round since that's how I'll be knitting the sweater. I'm basically, I'm using Alice Starmore's, oh, no, I'm all blurry again. Hey, back here, camera. Okay. I'm using Alice Starmore's Elizabeth I sweater pattern, which is, it's got raglan details and it's got a really pretty curved hem and then it's got some texture bands around all the edges and then the center has um, a cable with a triangle in it. I showed it on the podcast when I talked about acquiring this yarn in my stash. But I'm adapting it. I'm going to knit it in the round instead of flat and I'm changing the gauge because my yarn's a bit heavier, and I'm swapping out the center uh, cable for a cable from a different one of the sweaters in that book that has a thistle on it, because I love thistle, obviously, and <laughs> I think those are all, and then I'm going to modify the neckline a bit, because it's a really wide one, and I really like boat necks, but I want to make sure that I will be able to wear it with appropriate undergarments. And basically, I'm not going to make it super tight. I want it to feel almost like a comfy sweatshirt that I can just throw on over jeans, but also tuck into skirts. So I'm still doing some waist definition 
but there should be positive news in most of it. So, with all of that out of the way, oh, we're going to have to pause because I've talked for another eight minutes. So, I will splice it together again and argue with my camera later. So, here is what I have so far. I mentioned the curved hem, and before I started knitting it, I wasn't really sure if I was going to want to do a split hem. So I knit the short row part um, as two separate flat pieces. But now that I've been knitting it for a while, I'm definitely going to seam them. So I left yarn bits so I could seam. Anyway, and then I joined in the round. And so I've been doing the waist decreases, and I'm up to the part where I knit straight for the waist. It's just plain stockinette, so it's gone really quickly. I was reading a really engaging gothic book by Barbara Michaels, and I just kept knit, knit, knitting. So that's why I've made this much progress in such a short time. I'm also, um, I told you I just get really into sweaters. So <laughs> I'm happy with how it's looking so far, but I'm also a little confused because when I measure it just flat with my ruler, it's matching the gauge from the swatch. And I really liked the fabric in the swatch. It was like 5.333 stitches per inch. And so that's how I did all my calculations. So, but I ended up having to do more waist decreases. So I don't know, something's going funny with my gauge. Cause with this piece, if I put the ruler down it shows as, you know, a similar gauge, like about 11 stitches per inch. But the amount of stitches I have on my needles right now, the waist should now measure 20 inches, which would be a lot of negative ease. And it, when I tried it on, there's still positive ease. So I'm not really sure what's going on with that. It's not a huge deal because I wanted it to be a bit longer, so I just added a few more waist decreases. But I'm going to block it. Okay, that time it cut off because the battery was gone. This is definitely, I will try to record earlier next week so I can just use my computer. So, where was I? Oh, I was telling you that I'm going to block it because I like the fabric of the age swatch and the fabric on the sweater is looking a bit loose and I'm not sure if that will change when I block it or not. So I'm going to block it, wait for it to dry, and then decide whether I want to rip back or not because I don't know. I guess I must, I don't know what's going on with it. <laughs> It's one of those mysteries, I guess. So, and with that segue, which I'm sure has really established my authority, we all go into sweater knitting. I had a reader, or sorry, a viewer who asked, and of course now I can't remember her Ravelry name, I'm sorry. But she asked if I would talk a little bit about sweaters and how to adapt them to your fit and basically how to knit ones that you want to wear. So I'm happy to do that. She asked about what resources I like. So I will show you some of my favorite books and talk about the process that I do for doing my sweaters, either, you know, designing them from scratch or not. Uh-oh. Is the camera going to mirror it? Oh, man. Okay. So I guess we'll just show you this briefly. This is Knitting in the Old Way by Priscilla Gibson Roberts and Deborah Robson. This was the first knitting book that I bought myself because I got it from the library and I loved it so, so much. She basically, Priscilla Gibson Roberts, she takes Elizabeth Zimmerman's percentage system and she applies it to all these kinds of different sweaters, different, you know, construction methods. And then she discusses all of, all different kinds of sweaters that have come from all kinds of folk cultures and gives you suggestions for how to do it yourself. So it's just completely full of information, and it's very much for people who don't like following line-by-line -line patterns, but like to kind of do their own thing. So I have found this hugely inspirational. The section on Guernseys is what made me want to do my Guernsey sweater, and her Bavarian section is what made me do the Melusine cardigan that I recently finished. So basically I'm knitting my way through all the different well, not all of them, but a lot of the different folk books and folk sweaters in this. The next one I'm going to do is an Aaron Hamill one. Um, so I enjoy just reading it cover to cover because there's a lot of history in it as well. 
but she includes kind of basic plans, but hers are not fitted garments. Um, they're gonna fit you more in the way that, you know, I guess if you need to do a bunch of farm chores and stuff, you're gonna wanna make sure you have full range of motion. But I really love that one for inspiration. And then the other one that I use generally, I got this from my library, but I need to get my own copy, is Ann Bud's The Knitter's Handy Book of Sweater Patterns. Now I have her general handy book of patterns, which includes one for uh, bottom up seam sweater. And that's what I used for the Melusine cardigan for reference, but I really like this one and it's what I used for my first sweater because, and it's what I'm using to adapt the Elizabeth I cardigan, because she includes a whole bunch of numbers for all kinds of different gauges and all kinds of different styles. So I am unlikely to make the drop shoulder one just because I don't like how it looks, but I've used her raglan one and set in sleeves. And for the Erin cardigan I'm planning on doing, I'll be doing a saddle shoulder, which should be fun. And basically, once you get a gauge swatch that you like, you can measure your gauge, and then her schematics are really good, so you can find the sweater pattern that you should be following, and go from there. She does not include any waist shaping. So for her, I'm especially now, I mainly use it as reference for the shoulder area. So with the raglet, it helps for me to know, you know, my rate of decreases. And for the set in shoulder, I used it to figure out um, the depth of the armhole and the sleeve cap. Although I always have to modify it a little because she includes quite a bit of ease in her sleeves. I do like two inches around the biceps with positive ease. And her, I always have fewer stitches than she suggests. So she must put a lot of positive ease in there. But I really like that. And of course, the book that I can't show you, but that is hugely helpful, and the one that I would suggest getting first, if all you want to do is modify patterns to fit you, is Fit to Flatter by Amy Herzog. I read it before I started knitting my first cardigan, and I just loved it. She gives you all the information you can need about how to incorporate waist shaping and how to decide how much ease to put in different parts of the sweater, and um, how how to basically make a sweater your own. She talks about body shapes and how they're affected by different sweater designs. And that definitely, to me, that's like the one-stop book for how to make sweaters that you're pleased with, especially if you're interested in traditionally flattering sweaters. Um, so, you know, uh, her focus is on looking more hourglass-like, I would say. And, but she also, she's very much of the mindset of your body is great just the way it is. So you won't feel bad from reading her book. So I definitely recommend Fit to Flatter and I need to buy a copy from my own shelves. But yeah, she, it's just full of all sorts of information. And then I just got from the library her second book, which is Knit, Wear, Love. And I also really loved this one. This one, instead of focusing on body shape, and how to do sweaters to flatter your body. It focuses on personal style and how to do sweaters that express your personal style. Hang on. My camera battery is beeping at me again, so we'll see if we get through this. And I read this just a few days ago and I really loved it again. <laughs> Sorry, Moth is twining around the camera right now. Um, she discusses quite a few styles. I resonated most with vintage, obviously, and then a little bit of the casual and a little bit of the romantic, which probably seems like a bit of a contradiction, but it works for me. Let's hope Moth does not. Okay, she's good. Um, yeah, so I would say fit to flatter. You should start there because this book doesn't go into nearly as much detail about where you want positive and negative ease and how much and how to achieve that. But then this one will be really fun if you're not sure how to tell which patterns or what designs would fit into your closet. I'm very interested in personal style and I have been for a few years. So this wasn't so much new information for me as eye candy and I guess brain candy. And then the Fit to Flatter book includes several patterns for different styles of sweaters. 
And this one includes blueprints that are similar to the and bud blueprints, although they don't include as many gauges and the gauges tend to be bigger. So if you prefer fingering yarn like me, it won't be quite as useful. But I really like the different styles. Like she talks about how to do vests, tunics, cowl necks, and she shows you lots of ways to modify them and add little details. And that's what I really enjoyed because I was doing, it's basically the stuff that I was doing on my own, but written in a handy pretty format. So she she talks about what will make a sweater look more vintage, what will make it look more sporty, and how to add all kinds of interest to it. So I really loved this one and I want to copy from my shelves now as well. So okay establishing that Amy Herzog is definitely should be your first stop for when you want to customize sweaters. And if you can't get a hold of her books, she's been a guest on quite a few knitting audio podcast, especially when her books come out, and she tends to talk about the same principles. I know she did a guest episode on Knit FM, um, so you can kind of get a little bit of a sense of her philosophy from there before you decide to buy the book if you can't try it out at your library first. And I will be right back because I'm down to my eight. I'm not sure when I got cut off there, um, so I guess I'll just re-record. Basically, I would say... I know that sweater knitting can be very intimidating when you haven't done it before, but it's actually quite simple, especially if you start with something like a raglan, so you don't even need to worry about seam caps. That's what I did, and I think raglans look good on all kinds of people. So, yeah, I mean, waist and bust and hip shaping is just pretty simple arithmetic with your gauge and your body measurements and... So dive in, because for me at least, it was easiest to first read some books so that I had the principles under my belt and felt confident, and then just put it into practice. And I feel like I'm improving with each sweater. I am certainly not an expert by any means. You know, I still haven't been knitting terribly long, but I think that the knitting community is full of very intelligent people who enjoy sharing their knowledge. So in addition to the books, I would definitely recommend the Knit FM podcast, which has specific episodes about all kinds of aspects of sweater knitting, and will really talk you through making your first one and making it um, in a way that you enjoy the finished product. For myself, I really admire a lot of patterns, but I also know that I would not feel my best if I was wearing a sweater with like six inches of positive ease everywhere because I'm on the smaller side. I'm quite petite and I have curves, but they're on the smaller side as well. So they can get lost quite easily. So that's just me. And also because I tend to wear full skirts or wide legged trousers. So unless I'm wearing skinny jeans, you know, I've got quite a bit of volume going on bottom, so that's why I like to have more fitted sweaters on top. Not to mention, of course, it's cheaper because it uses less yarn and it knits faster. But I would say I think the key for sweater knitting is to choose a pattern or design your own of something that you really adore and that you're willing to put in the time and re-knit if something goes wrong because you know that you're going to love the finished object and wear it all the time and it will all be worth it in the end. And so yeah, I guess that would be most of my advice. And really quickly, I will talk about my stash acquisition because the light is almost gone. So I got a skein, another skein of Ultra Alpaca Fine, which is a Barocco sock yarn, and it is a blend of wool, alpaca, and nylon. I have knit four pairs of socks out of this now, including my first two pairs, and so they're like almost three, two and a half years old now, and they have held up really well. I find it is a really hard-wearing but soft and comfy yarn. So I'm pretty happy to keep knitting socks out of it. And I've been really in love with kind of, I don't know, I guess you'll call them medieval renaissance kind of yellows, you know, the really deep wrench kind of burnt ones. But I cannot wear them as sweaters because it turns my whole face sallow. It's very unfortunate. I love yellows. But then I realized that if I wore them as socks, that's far enough from my face that I probably wouldn't have any concerns. So I got this. And it's going to be my next pair of socks. Let's see if it will focus. 
It is the Tiger's Eye colorway. There it is. It's beautiful. The other thing I love about this yarn is that all the colors are heathered. And I'm a big fan of subtle colors and the kind of variation you get with heathering. And so, as I said, these are going to be my next pair of socks. And I ordered this now. I got it from D Stash for like $7, including shipping. It was very, it was a good deal. She has another one, too, if you want to be twinsies. Anyway, <laughs> because the December theme for the Solid Socks group is desert knitting. And I'm not a huge fan of deserts. I like my trees. I like my greenery. But when I think of inspirational deserts, I think of the Silk Road going through the Gobi Desert and the trade the traders, you know, in their caravans passing between China and Persia and all of that. So um, I found a pattern that kind of evokes that kind of feel to me. Sadly, I was thinking about getting the book Silk Road Socks by Hunter Hammerson, but it looks like it's not available for purchase anymore, even as an ebook. So instead, I found a different pattern. And I'm going to call them my Caravanserai Socks after the inns that the uh, traders would stay at that were set up throughout the desert. I'm very excited about these, and I should be done with my pointel socks by next week, so I'll be able to cast these on. Funnily enough, the pattern I found was actually a um, mystery, a former mystery knit-along for the other group, sock group I'm a member of, the Sock Knitters Anonymous group, and their theme for December is previous mystery knit-alongs, so I'll be able to do one pair of socks for both of them, which has not happened before. I knew Moth was going to flash you guys her booty at some point. Surprise it's taken this long. And then really quickly, I also got the book Botanical Knits. I decided that one of the sweaters would be a really great use of some of my worsted weight yarn and stash. And then I noticed I really liked all the other patterns, so I was trying to decide whether I wanted to get just the sweater pattern for $6 or go ahead and do the whole ebook for $18. And this was on Monday, which was Cyber Monday here. So that's like a Black Friday extension where all these online retailers offer coupons on Monday. And usually I just kind of ignore all that stuff. But Barnes & Noble had a discount, so I ended up getting this book for like $13. My mom's a member there, so I got free shipping too. And that was definitely worth it because I really love all the patterns. I've already put this sock pattern in my queue as well. And I think I would knit pretty much everything. I very much enjoy nature inspirations. And so those are my stash acquisitions. I hope that my rambling about sweaters helped a bit. As always, I am happy to answer any questions you might have via email, Instagram, Ravelry, and blog comments. I'm very accessible YouTube comments. Uh, and I will see you guys next week when hopefully I'll just be able to use my computer and not have to fuss so much. Do let me know, though, if you like this setup, and I'll do some research and figure out how to make it less tedious. But if you think I should stick with using my camera instead of my computer, then feel free to tell me that because, you know, I'm recording this to connect with you guys, obviously. I already talk about this stuff in my own head, so... <laughs> Whatever format suits you guys best is what I would do. And with that, thanks again for tuning in, and bye for now.